Well, happy winter to you. I've been uh, thinking about this whole uh, series broken, and I'm, I'm thinking we have a whole lot of broken hearts thinking, I wish I'd go back to school. <laughs> right. I think my daughter is the only one that wants to. Like, I'm pretty sure that my daughter is the only sick one that wants to get back into school. So every time, every time she hears uh, Barbara City has been canceled, she gets broken hearted. So this, serv- this series would just go right along with her. Some of y'all are uh, broken hearted when you're like, um, it's going to be 45 today, and the uh, roads are going to be clear and able to get to school. And you're like, oh, gosh, you just cut me deep. Uh, some of you are like, I wish that our my job had the same <laughs> rules that the school did. And if I want a day off, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just playing. But uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you're here uh, joining with us this morning, kicking off a new series entitled Broken. It's really kind of neat when you stop and think about the title, the word broken, like uh, we were in small group this last week, or our connect group, and I was asking them the question, like, when you hear the word broken, what do you think of? And, you know, you think of like a shattered glass, or a broken plate, or even a broken heart. You think of all kinds of things that could be broken, or my broken down piece of junk car, or I had, I broke my arm when I was a kid, or broke my leg, or, you know, something like that. You think of things that are broken. And uh, there's a whirlwind of things um, that we think of when we hear that term. But when you go to the Word of God, there's a whole lot of different, I mean, this is crazy. Like, when I just kind of kept that that word in my mind as I began to seek out the Scripture, I began to find all kinds of different windows or different types of, of brokenness. And what's really interesting about this is it seems as though that, there was kind of two angles of broken that I, I found pretty relevant in the scripture. One of them was that a person was prideful and they were very self-righteous and arrogant and all about themselves and they did it, I did it my way. They did it their way and then you end up with a broken kingdom or a broken home or broken situations. So you have the negative connotation of broken. But then you have In that same story and even on other stories of people who are living life situations that they didn't ask for, that it was just fed to them and it was dealt them by life itself. And it brought them to a broken place, paralyzed or blind or sick or leprosy, without family or all alone and you're broken. And you come to this place where you're so broken that you feel helpless and useless and devalued and that life just doesn't seem like it's going to make much sense. But it's in that broken state that you become the most vulnerable, that your heart becomes the most soft, and that God makes himself known even more. Because in that state, you know you need something. And the emptiness that you have and the brokenness just doesn't make a lot of sense, and you can't seem to put the pieces back together on your own. But what you didn't know, maybe what you didn't see before you came to that broken low, is that that is exactly where God wanted you. Because at the perfect time and at the perfect place and in the perfect way, he's going to enter into that broken state of your life. And he's not just going to put the pieces back together. He's going to make you much stronger from that brokenness than what you could have ever imagined. See, brokenness in God's eyes is a, it's a phenomenal whirlwind of how to make you strong in him. So we're losing signs. We have, we have a broken sign over here right now. <laughs> and God is going to show up sometime in the middle of the service and heal it. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. But, uh, but so anyway, so with that being said, God wants us in a broken state in order for us to be put together and to find our strength in him. Now, Today's passage of scripture is found in Mark chapter 2. If you got your Bibles, you'll want to turn open to it. Mark chapter 2 is, um, is just a delightful passage of scripture talking about somebody who was pretty broken. And, I, and this is what I'm going to do. I'll just, I'm going to kind of like teach a little bit along the line of how I get to where I get uh, in, some, in my sermons. Like, I'm pretty simplistic in my study. I'm a little ADD in my study. I never study the same way twice, and I never preach the same way twice. But with that being said, I kind of want to share with you a little tidbit so that when you get into the Word of God, let's say that you don't like reading 
Well, I'm a creative reader, so I have to like add creative things to my reading in order for it to hold my attention so that I can actually learn from it. So one of the things I like to do is I like to just basically make observations in what I'm reading. So what I do when I open up and I read through a chapter, I will make like, let's just say today, I'm going to, I'm going to make observations about the people I'm reading about. So what I'll do is while I'm reading, I'll circle the names. Like if it's okay, if Jesus is one of them, I'm going to circle Jesus. If, if the paralytic is one of them, I'm going to circle him. Four men, I'm going to circle four men. The crowd, circle the name. Scribes, I'm going to circle the name. And I make observations of these people. And then I just kind of sit back and I take the time to put myself in the shoes of Jesus and doing the things that he did. Step into the shoes of the paralytic and live through the life that he lived. I step into the life of the scribes and the one who knew the word of God and lived the life. And I step my sh- myself, I put my place in, in the midst of the crowd who is just seeing and observing and everything that was going on. So these are the people that we're going to experience today in this passage of scripture deal- dealing with the paralytic man that gets carried by some faithful ones. They have to go out of their way and, and get him to get him to Jesus. Well, Jesus does some pretty amazing things that enlightens us in the scripture, but I think we can make a lot more sense of it if we look into the lives of the people that were involved and then see where we fall in place. I think that that's going to help us allow God to speak and to to fill our lives with actions. And my goal today is that when you walk through that door, that you're going to be equipped with some tools in your belt to be able to make application in your life so that God could do a life change in you. Mark chapter 2, verse 1, reads like this. And today, uh, a lot of times I read out of a New Living Translation because it's just kind of a flow of a read. Today, I'm reading out of a New American Standard. And you can just follow along the best you can in your copy or listen very well. Here we go, verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Now, for those of you who don't know, he's from Capernaum and the uh, Jesus is, and he had actually been at Capernaum already, and he did some healings, and he did some phenomenal, awesome things. He had left and gone out to other communities and done some pretty phenomenal things, and he has come back. He has come back to where he's at. So I'll make application out of that after a little while, but let's just keep on trucking. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room and not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they, had, uh, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. They straight up dug a hole in the roof and to lower this guy down in there. I mean, not only are they get, is he getting ready to heal, heal a paralytic, but he's going to have to do some miracles to the roof patching situation uh, because they had to rip a hole in the roof to, uh, to get this guy down there. That's just awesome. I'm a contract. I, I was a carpenter, so like when I hear about stuff getting demolished and damaged, I'm all about studying. Like, I wonder what the roof was made of. You know what I'm saying? Like, like and I'll, you, you'll see. You'll see. Okay, here we go. Um, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, "Son, your sin." Wait, did I just skip something? Yeah, let me back up. Let me go to verse four. I just want to make sure I get this clear. Uh, he says, uh, being unable to get to him, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this before. 
We have never seen anything like this before. If I can promise you something right now, right here, when you open up the word of God and you allow Christ to do what Christ does, you're going to have, you're gonna have the, uh, the turnover in your mind that says, whoa, I ain't never seen anything like that before. So I'm going to invite God now in a word of prayer to show up and have the same impact on us this morning and walk out of here saying, I have never experienced anything like that before. Let's pray. Father God, I'm going to ask you to just show up and to be in our midst. I'm going to ask you to tend to the hearts that are hardened. I'm going to ask you to tend to the hearts that are faithful. I'm going to ask you to tend to the hearts that don't believe. And I'm going to ask you, Father God, that as we walk from this place, that we will have experienced your presence and that you would give us a life change, that you would, you would move in our heart in a way that maybe, maybe we've just forgotten, never experienced, or never slowed down long enough to listen. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's a pretty phenomenal thing when you stop and think about life change and you stop and think about somebody going from one state to a radical other state. Like, I love hearing the stories about people who were, I mean, this is kind of weird. I'm not wishing drug addiction on anybody. But, but if you've been a drug addict or you've been somebody who's been very violent or had a horrible background and out of nowhere, some life-changing wow brought them to a low. They got introduced to God and then all of a sudden their life just is radically different. And everybody is like judging them to the end, to the core, because they're like, is he really different? Is he really? I'm just waiting on him to go back to the old ways, you know? And, and you're, you're looking at this person's life, but then you're seeing some Pretty phenomenal things that you had never seen before. Do they still struggle? Yeah. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. Are they changing? Yeah. And it's awesome. It's awesome. I remember when I first got saved and, and I was walking the walk and trying to do right. The I mean, all of the first like things that came out of family members' mouths were like, well, we'll see how long this is going to last. Oh, you know, this is just a phase, you know, or this is just a season. There ain't no way that Jeremiah can't not blah, 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 and name off 50,000 things. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little bit nervous about my background check here at Connection Point because I'm afraid of what my staff members are going to see. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so, so when I look at my past and I realize that the implication of the people who knew me just was like, man, I don't know about that. Well, here's the deal. Change came in my life because I was broken. It didn't come in my life because I had it all together. You see, people have the wrong implication on life change. They think, if I could just get things in order, if I could just figure it out, if I could just handle my finances, if I could, if I could just get a job, if I could just go back to school, if I, if I, if I, if I, and you're going to find yourself on the plateau of pride, and it's going to be a long fall when you hit the ground. You see what I'm saying? That when it comes right down to life, God doesn't want us on the platform of pride. He wants, all, he wants us on our knees before the cross in humility and brokenness. Because I truly believe that God can work best with something that is broken than something that thinks it's already put together. Contractor can't work really good on a brand new house that just got put up. But you get a 50, 60, 70 year old house that needs a little renovating, got a little gunk in the junk when it comes to the pipes. The wiring is a little bit old. Things don't seem to work the way that really ought to. And God's like, I can work with that. Carpenter's hand, a master situation. And then he could go in and, and he could do a little bit of renovating. And what's really awesome about a renovation job is like, wow, that's a new house. It's awesome. And there's an impact. It's new. Shebang. But there's something phenomenal about looking at something that is old and junky and watching it become brand new. There's something really cool about that. I, I've fallen in love with, with, like, I mean, we bought a house back in Illinois, and I was able to buy it and, you know, start putting my hands on it. And, I mean, we had to gut the thing. We had to break it down before we could put it back together. And I just want you to know that sometimes the Christian faith is like that. A lot of people miss this. Like, I, I just, I just I'm, I'm not even preaching yet, okay? Um, a lot of people miss this. A, a lot of people miss that, that when you become a Christian, it's easy. No, it's not. You are new and you are made, made new, but there's a renovation job that needs to take place. You see, some of the old walls need to come out. Some of the old structure needs a little bit of shifting and changing. Your foundation isn't so strong and it isn't so good. There needs to be something broken in you in order to be built back up the way that God wants to build you up and to put you back together. The wiring system in you, the, the, the way the water flows in your life just isn't so good. So, so some of it has to be taken out and some of it has to go away in order for God to bring it, bring it back to where it needs to be. And you will see life change, and it starts with a state of brokenness. And when God begins to put the pieces back together, all of a sudden, you, knew, you just know that that's where they were supposed to be to begin with. God, I'm, I'm thankful that you 
broke me down the way that I broke because the way the pieces were together before wasn't even how you intended me to be put together. That enters us into this passage of Scripture, and there's four different types of people in this passage, and we're going to look at each individual, and I'm just going to, I'm going to make observations on four different groups of people. The first one is the paralytic and his situation in his life. And listen, it's going to narrow down to this. I think that in each one that we're going to look at, there's something that had to break. There's something that had to be broken in order for them to engage and to be right with where they were supposed to be with God. See, I think that there was something in the way of them and God, but something had to be broken in order for them to be right where they needed to be with their relationship with God. You see, I think that each and every one of us have the same kind of application that needs to happen. I think that there is something, even in a life of a Christian, as they are walking and moving and growing in their faith, I think that things get put in place that prevent us from getting close to God the way that we really need to get close to God. And there needs to be something broken. You see, brokenness doesn't just happen one time. You don't break the plate, put it back together, and eat off of it. No, 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 no. We have to be broken over and over and over until, until God gets the mold right. You see? So with that being said, we're going to look at the life of the paralytic. We're going to look at the four men that carried him to Jesus. We're going to look at the scribes and, and their situation and what prevented them from being with God the way that they needed to be. And then we're going to look at the crowd. And I'm just simply going to make observations of all four. And when we get to the end of this thing, I pray and hope that you find your place and see what kind of decision. Because we're going to get to the end, and I'm going to just tell you ahead of time that I'm going to give a few call-outs of something that you need to take action. And you're going to have an opportunity to just stand right where you're at and say, this is... I've got to make that change right there. I've got to make that change right there in my life. Otherwise, I'm not going to be right with God the way that I need to be. Yes, that should be water, but it's coffee. <laughs> okay. Let's look at the life of the paralytic. You know, stop and think about being paralyzed. Stop and think about being demobile, okay? He couldn't move. He couldn't go anywhere. The word of God says that he was on a pallet, like he, he was unable. And it actually says that he was laying, like when they lowered him down, he was laying, the, the, the Greek word would have been laying out, like completely flat laid out on the pallet. We don't know how paralyzed he was. We just know he straight up couldn't get there on his own. So let's look into the life of him. What I see, just observation of thinking of a paralytic and needed four people to carry him. I don't know if he was a big dude or a small dude. I just know it took four people to carry him. But he was unable to get to Jesus on his own. The paralyzed person was unable to get to Jesus on his own. Therefore, there was something that was disabling him, and obviously he was paralyzed. Again, we don't know what, but whatever his disability was, it kept him from getting to where he needed to be. So I bet, stepping into the shoes of the paralytic, he felt helpless. He felt helpless, and he probably felt lonely. Probably had some anxieties of, of, about how he was going to make it from day to day because he couldn't, he couldn't work the, the right way. He couldn't do things like everybody else could. And, and he heard of Jesus. See, stop and think of this. In, in the previous chapter, Jesus was in Capernaum, and, and he healed, and he cast out a demon out of a guy and did some phenomenal things, and then he left. I can only imagine. Imagine what the paralytic was thinking, laying out on his pallet in the street. Man, I saw and heard of God doing some pretty awesome things, but he's gone, and I don't know if he's going to come back. I don't know if I have a chance. Imagine what he thought of when he heard Jesus came back home. He felt hopeless and unsure, <laughs> and then he felt not forgotten and valued. You see, God has a pretty phenomenal way when you're in the pit of despair and you feel demobilized and things have, have, have been dealt you in life that you couldn't change, that you couldn't move, yet God's got you in mind. You want to know why? Because he calls people in your life to surround you, to come to you and meet you where you're at. God is pretty phenomenal. He actually goes out of his way to meet us where we're at, and it's not always in a church house. It's not always in a premier party church plant. Sometimes it could be in your office. Sometimes it could be in your home. Sometimes your spouse can say, man, check this out. Or I would like for you to go with me too. Why? Because God knows where you're at. He knows where you're broken. He knows where you're unable. And he is going to provide a way to mobilize you to get you where you need to be. But not in your own strength, in your broken state. He will get you where you need to go. God 
values you so much so that he will make a way. He will make a way. He ha- You're not here today because God didn't make a way for you to be here. He opened up a door for you to come at 1104 to Connection Point Church to hear the word of God preached to you because God had a message for you today. God made a way and put people in your life to invite you to this place. People in your life to try to intervene into your life and say, hey, there is a God, there is son. We've got to get you to Jesus no matter what it takes. And all of a sudden you feel valued. You feel like, well, somebody cares. I don't give a flying hooey about this Jesus guy. But this person cares enough about me to think that I need to be with him, so maybe I ought to go. Maybe I ought to let them carry me. Feel provided for the right people at the right time or willing to bring you to the right place. Why? Because God wants to rescue you. He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. He wants to take you where you need to be. He doesn't want to leave you broken and lowly. No, no, no. See, that's the sin of the world consequences. He wants to pick you up, and he wants to carry you. He wants to bring you to the rooftops and lay you at the feet of Christ. That's where he wants to bring you. So I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what has disabled you. I don't know what has enabled you. I don't know what has broken you. I don't know what disabilities you have in your life, spiritually or physically, but I'm telling you God is intervening in your life because you're here right now. And for those of you who are listening online, you're listening for a reason. Mm-mm. This is the phenomenal thing about the paral- paralytic guy that I thought about stepping in his shoes. When he was sitting on the street in his pallet or sitting on a curb or sitting in a field or wherever the world he was in his pallet, this, this, this is interesting. He had no idea, had no clue, sitting there all broken and lame, had no idea how God was going to use him that day. Had no idea. He had no idea the implication of life change that was about to happen in his life. He was about to go from demobilized to mobilized. He was about to go from no-go to go-go. He was about to go from being dropped to being hopped right out the door and moving for God. I just totally made that up and went with it. It was good. I like it. He had no idea how free he would be by being led to Christ. Had no idea the freedom that would come from being in the presence of God himself. And he had no idea (laughs) that the awesomeness of the broken chains of bondage, of how much better it feels when the chains are broke and he is set free than when he was broken and in a street. He had no idea. Sometimes we have no idea the true value and desire that God has for us and what he wants to do in our lives until we just let somebody intervene and help. If if you're the paralytic today and somebody has been intervening in your life to somehow get you closer to Christ because you ain't been able to do it on your own, let him carry you. Let them rip through. what They know how to go around the crowd. They know how to rip through the roof. They know where Christ is located, and they want to bring you there. Let go. I want to talk about the four men. I want to look at the life of the four men that carry this guy. Man, words that come to my mind are faithfulness, awesomeness. Like, I just, I think that they're, they're amazing. Aware of needs, aware of God, aware of where God is, how to get to close to God, how to get to God. They were just They saw needs and they were willing to meet it. The faithfulness of these four men are pretty phenomenal, really. There's lots of really neat things that I I listed off. And these are literally just observations of me stopping and taking the time to read through this and just think, okay, where were they at? What were they thinking? How, How was it going down? They were willing to go where the broken were at. I'm talking to the Christian right now. If you're visiting for your first time, second time, third time, you ain't, whole, you ain't sure about this God thing, I want you to listen to me drop it like it's hot on these Christians, okay? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ here today, I'm talking directly to you when I speak of these four men because here's the thing. You can show up every time the church door is open, and you can walk into Connection Point every Sunday morning. You can get involved in our Connect group. You can be aware of needs and people who are broken, who need you to intervene in their life on their behalf, and do nothing And you are breaking your relationship with God. He wants you to move. He wants you to go where they're at. This is a training ground. 
He wants to equip you here, empower you here, mobilize you from here, and send you out to go. That is our whole mindset and connection point is to not keep you here and to not create an environment for you to come to, but to help you be aware of people who absolutely need God in their lives, who need healing, who have needs, who need to be loved because they're not getting it from somebody else. They need to get it from God, and you may be the only source to get it to them. These four men went to the paralytic. Have you ever asked this question? I mean, just out of curiosity, I, just by a show of hands, how many of y'all have either heard of this story, heard this story, read this story, or already knew this story before right now? Like, okay, majority right here. Have you ever asked the question, why four men? Why not three? Why not five? Why four? I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us why four. I'm being creative right now. But why four? I mean, I think about Christ, and he had kind of like an inner circle of three, and there was four of them. We got like two legs and two arms. It's like it was easier to carry the paralytic. I don't know. I'm just making that up. But I'm like trying to figure out why four, you know, like four corners of the pallet. We can lower them in easier. I don't, I don't know. Why, why not ten? Why not eight, nine? I don't know. I think there's a pretty significant application in it, though. So I'm not going to try to get all spiritual on this number four. But what I am going to tell you is this. I truly believe that God can do much more with much less if you're willing, you're obedient, and you're unified with people who have the same desire you do. I say this, Christian. Give me three of you that are faithful. We will rock Barberville with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would rather take three of you who are absolutely passionate about preaching people for Jesus and the rest of you go home. That's what I'm saying. You get passionate about the gospel of Jesus Christ, be willing to go, be willing to reach, be willing to rock it for the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm telling you, we can make a difference. We can, we can help paralyzed be healed. We can rock the crowds and put them in awe by the faithfulness of four rather than the faith. Man, there was a crowd of people in the presence of Jesus that weren't making a difference. They just sitting there watching and listening, watching and listening. But there were four people that were getting it done. See, listening to the word is important, but getting after it, mm -mm -mm. Life change and life impact is not going to happen if we stay sitting right here. That's why I like that these chairs are mobile. We move them when we're done. So you can't stay sit. I think we can do much more with much less. All right, things to learn about their faithfulness. This is pretty cool. Doing the right thing is always hard work, Christian. If you're going to be faithful and you're going to be obedient to God to actually walk that fine line, I'm going to tell you right now, it's harder than what you think. It's not the easy road. It's not the broad road. It's not always the funnest road, but it does have the most amount of joy, the greatest reward, and it's where you belong. But it's hard. Do you think, do you think carrying a guy and busting through a roof and lowering down to Jesus was easy. It took faithfulness and risk. I mean, ripping through somebody else's roof. Imagine if you were sitting there eating dinner, chomping on your pork chop or a chicken leg and eating some corn, cornbread. What else we like? Green beans, mac and cheese, banana pudding. Um, we just, amen, Lord. Just need to pray on that. Banana pudding with the little vanilla wafers in them. Strawberries. Mm. <sighs> okay. You're sitting there chomping on your meal, and, and somebody's sitting there sharing the word of God, and out of nowhere, like through your roof comes a man being lowered down on a thing, and he just plops him like right in front of you. I mean, just like, I mean, if you weren't Jesus, you'd be like, I got to fix that. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I mean, somebody in that crowd was thinking about the bill. You know what I mean? Like, somebody was sitting there like, ain't no way. You did that to my house. I'd be calling the law and then putting in a security system in my roof. You know what I mean? That'd be like little wires across the roof so when you bust through next time, it's going off. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't happening twice. So that's how we think. We, we think busting through the roof, well, that's interesting. But think about sitting there and a the roof gets busted in and it's your house. I mean, it's kind of a weird deal. I don't know how I got off on that tangent. <laughs> let's, let's get back to what we were talking about. 
Doing the right thing is always hard work. It ain't easy. I mean, pulling into your own money to give to a church you're committing to hurts sometimes. Actually, doesn't hurt most of the time. Because we're really not working that hard. And don't want to be super generous, we just want to be generous enough. We don't want to help somebody who either has to pay a bill or, or has some work to do because it, it will cost me my time and, and interrupt my schedule and I have to make myself more. I'm already helping a lot of people. I'm, I... No, being a Christian is hard work and it calls for sacrifice. You see, he says to die to yourself daily and live for him. And if that's the case, and doors of opportunity keep on coming at you, knock on the door, and you ain't doing nothing about it, and you are already broken. Many times, God will lead you to something that doesn't make any sense, like going through a roof. He'll ask you to be faithful. Watch this. Y'all going to hear me. You're, you're all going to hear this. He'll ask you to be faithful, and then he'll put opposition right in front of your face to see if you're for real. Hey, take that paralytic to Jesus. Okay. There's a crowd there. He's in there, and we're out here. What do we do? Silence. I know he told me to take the paralytic to him. Now the how. Christian, <laughs> you've got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Go through the wall. Go through a window. Bust through the roof. But be obedient and do whatever it takes. <laughs> but be willing to do Whatever it takes. Uh, what made the four go get them? Have you ever thought of that? What made the four actually go get them? I guarantee they were in a state of brokenness at one time, and God pulled them out of the streets and led them to Jesus. I guarantee they had been bit impacted. I, they, it doesn't say this here, but I wonder if these four guys were any family or any kin or any anything to the people who had been healed in Capernaum early on, and they knew what Jesus was capable of. I'll speak for myself right now. I was once broken and at a low of a low of a low in my alcoholism, in my broken relationship, in my broken home. I was a sucky father. I was a sucky husband. I sucked with my money. I was no good at anything that I was doing, had no purpose, had no value, and God showed up with somebody else. And in the state of my brokenness, he brought healing. He took all the broken pieces and he began to put it back together. And the bond that I have from my broken pieces together is much stronger now than it ever was. And you know what that has caused me to do? It has caused me to want to go. I mean, I have been willing to do whatever it takes for about seven or eight years now. I left a comfort zone in my home to move to eastern Kentucky. Let's not pity Jeremiah right now, but what I'm telling you is the mobilization of these four men willing to go was because they were at a broken state and experienced the life change of God. And they were willing to do whatever it takes to impact other people with the gospel. You have got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Maybe you're sitting here today and you feel like you're a Christian, but you're not making an impact and you're not doing anything and you're not going. You know, have you ever stopped and thought, maybe I've never presented myself broken before God. Maybe I've thought myself of a pretty good person and then presented myself to God and said, oh God, save me, but I'm pretty good. Save me in my goodness. Oh, I'm so good, God, just save me. Save me, I'm good though. That ain't getting you nowhere, but confused and in a seat or a pew. Still and complacent, wondering what in the world is going on. Why does that guy have all the passion and motivation, and I'm sitting here like a bump on a log? Lack of brokenness. You are dirty and deserve hell. I am dirty and deserve hell. There is nothing better about me than you. I am a sinner saved by grace. I have lied, I have stolen, I have cheated. In my heart, I have thought and felt bad things towards other people. But with the love and the grace came from God into my life, and I gripped a hold of that, and he changed me, and he changed who I am. I've never been the same. So my motivation is that I want that for you. If you're sitting in here today and have never experienced that love of God, I'm telling you that he wants to rescue you. He wants to save you. He wants to meet you where you're at. He wants to take you from the street. He wants to put you in his presence so that he can forgive your sins 
and heal your brokenness and set you free. Mm, that'll preach. The last two, which are actually going to go pretty fast, are the scribes and the crowd. You know, the scribes were people who absolutely knew the law. The scribes were ones who would transcribe the law and make other writings of it so that other synagogues and other places would have it. They were very knowledgeable of the word. They actually memorized large amounts of the Old Testament. I mean, a phenomenally large amount of the Old Testament. They knew the writings. They had knowledge. They knew it all. Can I help y'all with something today? If you are one of these people that are super knowledgeable, and you all know some people like this, you know some people that, man, they are so smart in the Word. They know all these scriptures. They know these verses. They know the background. They know all the stuff about the Bible, but they don't do jack crap for Jesus. I mean, they, they're probably going to hell with all their knowledge. Why? Because they ain't rocking it. They ain't doing nothing. They're not showing any fruit. They just show how much they know. If they were to go to the Bible class, they'd probably get an A+. They stand before Jesus. Knowledge don't get you into heaven. You can memorize this book front and back. That don't get you squat, but just a little smarter about the word. Humility and broken. You see, God doesn't give grace to the prideful. He gives grace to the humble. Humility. The scribes weren't very humble. I believe that I would probably say like this. They were overeducated and all about the law. But because they knew so much, they were blind by realizing who was right in front of them the whole time. They were so knowledgeable and making sure that they were right in what he was saying and that all this stuff, so that as he is like, I am forgiving the sins of the paralytic, they're thinking, hold up, only God could forgive man on earth. And they were reasoning in their mind, and they're like, man, what is wrong with it? This guy is like making claims and doing stuff. I, he ain't God. He ain't God. They had doubt. They had unbelief. See, the scribes were religious who was, but they had no faith. So they sat. The Bible actually says they were sitting and reasoning in their hearts and in their minds. I like the word sitting because I think that's what most Christians do is they sit a lot. We like our pews to be comfortable. We like our chairs to be padded because that's where we find ourselves most of the time. You walk through the door and you think, where do I sit normally? I'm going to go there because my butt imprint is on that seat and I feel good about being there. I hope the same chair is there next week it is this week because I got that sucker broke in. God don't want you on your backside. He wants you climbing the housetops and lowering people down on pallets. He wants you meeting needs. He wants you loving people in the Christ. He doesn't want you sitting still. So if you are one of those that are sitting in here today that would fall into the shoes of the scribe where you have a lot of knowledge but you're not meeting needs and you're not sharing the gospel and you're not leading people to Christ, you're on a wrong road. I don't care how much you know. You're on the wrong road. Kept him from God. Thought he was just like, like, I can step into the world of those who don't believe that Jesus is God because the scribes are those people. So if you're sitting here today and you're not a believer, listen, I tell everybody this all the time. I'm here today to put truth that I believe is truth on the table. It's up to you on whether or not you eat the same food I'm eating. So I'm just here to present it to you. You, you have the choice, and I permit you to believe. I mean, you can take the Jesus stuff and set it off to the side and make application all you want to, and that's entirely up to you. But right now, I am telling you that you can be all knowledgeable. You can have straight A's. You can have a great education. You can have a PhD. You can be a doctor. You can make medicine and stick people in need. I don't care what it is that you do, but when you die, you're going to stand before a God. If this is true, you are going to stand before an almighty God who I believe created all the world. He created the law. He created the right and wrong. He gave you a conscience. He wrote it on your heart so that you would know when you do right, know when you do wrong. He revealed himself in the awesomeness of all of the world around you. He sent his son to live. He sent his son to die on a cross. And if you just answer the question, why did Jesus have to die? Why? Because you're a sinner and he was not. And something perfect had to pay the penalty for your sin. What does believing in Jesus get you? It gets you life. Eternal life. He rose from the dead. And last I checked, he's the only God that's claimed to be God that rose from the dead. 
And because he rose from the dead, he conquered death, and it does not have victory over him. I want to serve the God where death doesn't have the victory over him because I am dead in my transgression. I am dead in my sin. I am dead in my brokenness. I'm dead wrong without him. He is God. The scribes didn't think he was. He thought he was sinning. They thought he was blaspheming when he was sitting here claiming to be God who could heal and to cleanse. They sat and they reasoned. Let me help you paint this picture. For a person who comes and sits and isn't taking any action, this is what they do. They sit and they sit. And because they're sitting and doing nothing, you become critical of everything that's going around you. I guarantee that some of y'all have probably heard a little bit of criticism about Connection Point. Or some of you may have been skeptics before ever walking through the door. Man, why do we need a new church? We've got 50 of them. Well, they think they're better than us and all this other stuff. And we're not all about pleasing people and trying to itch people's backs and all that kind of stuff. We're just simply reaching people that aren't being reached. All about the de-church and the unchurch. That's, that's our focus. That's our goal. God gave a pastor to step in, uh, a call to step into a local church. God gave me a vision to step into the community and do something brand new and different. There is nothing wrong with either one. There isn't. But I guarantee the people that are sitting back that aren't doing a whole lot are reasoning. And they're thinking, what's this guy doing? They're coming up with all of these thoughts, but yet they're just sitting and they're just reasoning. Don't listen. If you're a new Christian, if you've been a Christian for a long time, do not, don't let yourself get there. Don't let yourself get in the seat of the scribe. That ain't no good. It ain't no good. It doesn't help anybody paralytic still sitting in the streets of faithful people. I, I'm a scribe sitting in the front seat. You know what I'm saying? This is what I'm saying. Bam, there comes the paralytic, and I'm looking forward. This is what I see. What I see is a paralytic laying at the feet of Jesus, humbled and broken, tore apart, ripped to shreds, but he's closer to Christ than I am, for one. Secondly, I look up in the hole in the roof, and what do I see? I see faithful men. You know what you see when you're sitting and somebody's standing up in front of you doing work? Somebody who's being faithful. In the sitting position, nothing's getting done, but you see the faithful ones who are. It's time to get up. It's time to get up and it's time to be faithful. And if you're sitting here and you've been that religious person and you've been all about uh, church polity and church politics and what's going on and what's right and what's wrong and making sure that you've got all the, all the things going on and, and we're spending money on this and some money on that, you know that stuff doesn't matter. People matter. And if we're, we're not all about the people, they were more about him keeping the law than they were this paralytic having sins forgiven and him being cleansed and healed and walking out that door. The last group of people were the crowd. You may be somebody who is sitting here today that's just curious. And it's just part of the crowd. Curious about who this God is. Who is this Jesus? How can he impact my life? How can he make a difference? What is he all about? Is he real? Is he legit? Whoa. Whoa. Do you realize that even if you're just somebody who's in the crowd that isn't this paralytic person, isn't a faithful Christian go-go person that's dropping people through roofs, you're not a scribe who is critical, you're just there and you're just curious. God wants to impact you too. You look at the lives of the faithful, you look at the lives of the ones who are being saved and you will have the same response. You see, what I look at in the crowd is I see unsure. I see unsureties. I see curiosity. I see people that are seeking and just don't know what they're looking for. But they're also selfish. Because in their life, the way they spend their money and the way they live things and the way they do things, they're not really looking for needs. They're not, it's just kind of in your own little world. You have your job. You're trying to make it to the next level. You have your family. You want a couple kids. You want a nice car. You're, you know, it's the American dream. That's where you're at in the crowd is the American dream. There's nothing wrong with the American dream but when it's all about you, not a whole lot of value. But the person who was sitting in the crowd was definitely willing to listen. And when God moved and changed somebody else's life, let me help you with something. The crowd was the preventative of somebody getting to Christ sooner than what they should have because they were selfish. You see, the people in the, in the crowd can prevent people from getting to Christ the way that they need to. However, when God moves, let me back up. Christian, when you're trying to get people to Christ, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have opposition. Most of the time, your opposition are going to be religious people. 
There are going to be people that are in the church. It's going to upset you. It's going to make you mad. It's going to make you detour and go somewhere else. But that's okay. God will put you through a roof. So anyway, with all that being said, what's going to happen is that God's going to, opposition is going to happen. People that don't know God, people that do know God, they're going to get in your way. You let God deal with them. When God moves and changes the heart of a man, he will split the crowd wide open like he did the Red Sea. And he will change the heart of the crowd. He will change the heart of the people that are there. You may be somebody sitting there in the crowd that's hearing somebody's life change like myself or somebody else who's been inviting you to come. Wherever you're at today, I want to share with you what needs to be broken. In the life of the paralytic, there is hopelessness. Maybe today, the hopelessness, the not being valued, the unsure, the brokenness. Maybe you've just been demobilized and you need hope today. Maybe... It's the opposition as a Christian. You're trying to be faithful. You're trying to do the right thing. And people are getting in your way. And circumstances are getting in your way. And Tom's getting in your way. And God's just saying, keep on going, baby. Keep on trucking. You just give it all and knock it out. Just keep on rocking it. Maybe today it's unbelief. You're sitting here today, and I'm not sure if I want to believe in this God. I'm not sure if I want to let go and let God. I'm not sure. But, but, but I'm critical, and I'm, I, I don't know. And you just need to be all about people. Not all about whether they're doing it right or wrong or doing it your way. And maybe what needs to be broken is your spirit and your pride. Don't be just sitting in the crowd anymore. Jesus Christ died for you because he loves you. He created you to have a relationship with him, and you can have that today. If I could have a musician come forward and play something, anything at all, that would be awesome. As we come into this time of closing, I just want to say this. However you walked into this place today, that is not how God intended you to leave. You see, in every moment of every hour of every day, God desires to intervene in some way, shape, or form to kind of do like John the Baptist said. He wants you to become less so that he could become more. If life is not making sense to you and you've had things thrown at you that you can't explain, but it has broken you down and it has hurt you, whether you've lost a loved one or you're having a broken relationship situation or a work situation or a life situation or whatever it is and God is intervening in your life and he's saying, come to me. And if you can't get there on your own, I'm going to bring you somebody who can get you there. Just go on for the journey and let go and let God. If you, I'm just going to stop on this. If you were here today and you are broken because of the things that life has thrown at you and you need to be healed and you need to be set free and you want God to cleanse you in the state of your brokenness and it's out of your control and you don't know what else to do, I'm going to ask you to stand right now and say, Jeremiah, that's me and I just want you to pray for me right now. That is me. I am just broken. And I need for you to pray for me. If that is you today, I'm just going to ask you to stand. Amen. If you are broken, amen, amen, amen. If you are just broken, your spirit is broken, your life is broken, and you just need me to pray for you right now, stand up. I'm going to pray for you guys. Father God, I don't know where these guys are at, but I know their desire and their heart's need is for cleansing and for healing and for setting free. Lord God, you took the paralytic out of the street by faithful people. You brought him through the roof and you laid him at the feet of Jesus. I am in Jesus' name taking these folks that have stood up right now and I'm laying them at your feet and I'm asking you, Lord God, that you would set them free, that you would cleanse them from the inside out. And Lord God, that you would change their hearts and change their lives and allow them to impact the crowd around them. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. You may be seated. You may be somebody who is sitting here today. You're a Christian. You know the right thing to do. You've been fighting to do the right thing. And opposition keeps on coming your way. There are things that are in your path that are preventing you from doing the right thing. You desire to do the right thing, but you don't know how to act on it. You don't know which way to turn. You don't know if you're supposed to be pushing through the crowd or busting through a roof. But you want to do the right thing. You want to get with the right people. You, you want to be a part of those four. And maybe you're not, and that is you today. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Amen, amen. Amen. Anybody else looking for that? You want to be a part of that 
passionate, faithful for. He's saying, God, use me. Is that you today? Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I just, I want to thank you for these ones who have stood and said, God, I want to be amongst the faithful, passionate ones that are doing whatever it takes to reach into the lives of those around me, that I see needs, that I can make a difference, and I can draw them nearer and closer to you, Father God. Anything that may be standing in their way, Father, I want to pray in Jesus' name that you would begin to deal with it, that you would give them a passion that would drive forward even when opposition comes, whether it's people or life circumstances or whatever it is, give them the drive to serve you no matter the cost. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to group the last two together. You've got the scribes and you've got the crowd. And you may have already stood up and that's okay, or maybe you haven't stood up yet. You've had disbelief. You've had unbelief. You've had a hard time letting go and letting God just take control of everything that you are and who you are. And you want your life to be Christ's, but you've sat and you've done nothing. Maybe you, you, have, you have thought in your mind and been critical. Maybe, maybe you've been that religious, knowledgeable person and haven't ever just let go and let God have your heart and have your soul and come to him broken because of your sin and who you are. Maybe you're just sitting out there in a the crowd, unsure, listening and you're singing. And right now you got something boiling up in you right now that's just like, I want to let go and I want God to have all of me. If you are ready to let go and let God have all of you in this moment, right now, I'm just going to ask you to stand up and say, I want God to have my heart, my soul, and my life from this day forward. I'm going to ask you to stand. Is that you today? Is that you today? I don't normally do this. My heart is beating out of my chest right now because I almost feel like somebody else has the same situation going on. So in my brokenness, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give that invite one more time for somebody who is sitting here really struggling with whether to stand up or not. Heavenly Father, whoever it may be that is sitting in our presence right now, in your presence right now, and they're unsure, and they're having a hard time praying, God, I want to I wanna ask you to just break through. I want to ask you, Lord God, to set them free and to give them the assurance that you are God. You are who you say you are. You are who we preach that you are. And Father God, that you want to change their life and set them free from their sin and give them eternal life. And, and God, I just pray, I pray that you would set them free, that you would break the chains of the sin bondage that they've been living in. And Lord God, that they would let you be God of their life. If that is, if that is you today and you're ready to claim that victory, I'm going to ask you to stand up right now. If that is you, Stand up. Let me make this clear. There's nothing holier in this moment than there is after the service or this afternoon when you're in your home or when you're in your bedroom or your bathroom or your living room or wherever and you decide that you want to let go and let God have it. You do it. Man, today is awesome. Just give, give God a big praise round of applause or something. Make some noise. As we, uh, as we close this down, I'm going to ask my offertory guys to come forward. Look, what's phenomenal about Connection Point is everything that we are dumping into Connection Point, our time, our money, our everything, is all about investing into life change, whether it's in you or the people that we're reaching in the community. And I'm watching it happen left and right. Like when I look to my left and all the way across, I see, I see lives that are being radically changed on a weekly basis. Sometimes it's just that little thing, like, like they got into the Word for the first time and God just, God just rocked them. Or, or maybe, maybe they had a five-day victory because they read all the way through the book of James and they look back in five days and they see their journal and they're like, wow, God has shown me so much. Man, it's only five days. There's something amazing about when you allow God to intervene in your life and lead. Everything just makes sense. It's not, it's not that it gets easy, but it's that it's right. And it's awesome. God wants to use you to make an impact and love you right into 
right into a stronger relationship with him. So as we give the generosity from our hearts and from yours, if, if you don't go here, I, we're not asking you as a visitor to drop in the plate, but if you feel led to give, do it out of the generosity of your heart. But today, it's an act of worship for us. So we love God with the way that we give. I invite you to pray with us one last time. Father God, I want to thank you in Jesus' name for allowing us to worship you and adore you in this hour. I pray, Father, that as we give our tithes and our offerings and our finances and just that it would bless you, that we would bless you by the way that we give. That, Lord God, that you would take this, this money and that you would give us wisdom as we begin to apply it to ministry and to lives being changed for your sake. In Jesus' name we pray.